родин, що перебувають під опікою та піклуванням, а саме діти-сироти та позбавлені батьківського піклування. Також діти із родин, що опинились в складних життєвих обставинах, із родин внутрішньо переміщених осіб. Одним з найскладніших випадків є роз'єднання родини, розлучення батьків та дітей. Та все ж таки ми наважились на воз'єднання однієї з таких родин. Детальніше про цю сім'ю розкаже начальник місцевої служби у справах дітей та сім'ї. Одна із таких родин, яка перебуває в складних життєвих обставинах, це є родина Кретнєвих, села Чупира. Це багатодітна родина. У них на вихованні батька і матері семеро діток. Із них наймолодшим двом близнюкам по півтора рочку. Родина перебуває в складних життєвих обставинах. На жаль, так склалося, що були такі моменти в їхньому житті дуже складні, що вони потребували нашої допомоги та підтримки. І, на жаль, були роз'єднані діти від батьків. І перебували деякий час в центрах реабілітації, а наймолодші перебували в дитячому будинку в місті Біла Церква. Але завдяки підтримці, зусиллям, сторонній підтримці і самим батькам, які теж постаралися воз'єднати родину, родина в повному складі, всі разом, спільно з благодійним фондом громадян в рамках реалізації проєкту запобігання ризиків у сфері захисту прав дитини, за підтримки благодійного фонду Street Child Ukraine, також за потужної підтримки і допомоги громадської організації Дом 4824. Дані родині було придбано та передано пральну машину, також було придбано постільна білизна, подушки, ковдри, одяг, взуття, блендер, міксер, толок, та кухонний посуд. Ми сподіваємося, що більше роз'єднання родини не відбудеться. Ви подолаєте складні життєві обставини. Ми завжди будемо приходити на допомогу. Дуже дякуємо тримці фонду. Сподіваємось на подальшу співпрацю. І щоб ваша сім'я була міцною, і щоб ви завжди були разом. Після надання психологічної підтримки та передачі засобів для функціонування і життєдіяльності сім'ї Кретови, ми не залишаємо їх без уваги. Звісно, ми підтримуємо з ними зв'язок, щоб вони могли стати гідним прикладом для своїх дітей. А діти – це наше майбутнє. Ми сподіваємося, що ви усвідомлено будете підходити до свого батьківства і насправді засвоїте ті уроки, які ви прожили. Бажаю, щоб складні життєві обставини не затьмарювали вашого цього щастя, тому що сьогодні в очах дітей я побачила надзвичайну любов, безумовну любов. І діти насправді пишаються вами і вашим зміненим уже способом життя. Тому продовжуйте так надалі і завжди пам'ятайте, що є ті люди, фонди, які завжди готові прийти на допомогу. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here today, despite the slight delay. Tomorrow you need to, be, to do a better job, okay? Show on time. <laughs> um, my name is Riyadh, and I will be your host for today. And if you don't know yet, I'm all for localization. So I would have like, been uh, ready to duel for this uh, uh, session today. Um, I wanted to say some notes before we start, but we don't have time. I want to make up time. You know that localization is very important. It is in its core about shifting the power to local organizations, about putting them in control of the knowledge, of the activities, of what we are doing on, on the field. And today we will have with us two distinguished speakers uh, who are working for international uh, organizations and will be uh, telling us how they are trying to shift the power towards more local actors and towards the communities. Um, so today we will have uh, um, Marcello Viola, uh, the Global Protection Advisor at State Child. Welcome. Uh, he, he's dedicated his career uh, to protecting and promoting children rights and advocating uh, to the localization agenda. Since uh, 2013, uh, he has been instrumental in leading stri uh, street child's humanitarian uh, efforts across various African uh, countries. Next, we have uh, Emily Galloway, uh, the Senior Technical Advisor uh, for Protection at Global Communities. Uh, she brings over 13 years of experience in humanitarian response, including her work with United Nations and various NGOs. Welcome. So uh, for today, we will be hearing from our speakers about what they are doing. Then I will be asking them some questions. And 
then we will open the floor for more questions from your side. So give them a hard time. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> Be gentle. <laughs> Uh, I would like to start with you, Emily. Uh, please take us through your opening remarks. Great, thanks, Riyad. And yes, as you said, I think it's important to recognize that we are international NGOs sitting up here talking about localization. But I do hope that our experience can be helpful for the conversation. And um, I think we both in our discussions have realized we've taken a lot of similar approaches to how we really have tried to shift power from ourselves to local organizations and the communities. Um, so I'll start by giving an overview of how we approached child protection localization in our Ukraine response. We as global communities have been in Ukraine for a number of years on the development side. So we've had a number of years working on local governance through which we worked with local communities all across the country. So we had engaged with dozens of communities, um, the community level, the local authorities. And so when the full-scale invasion began in 2022, we really felt that that was a good um, way for us to leverage um, and work on localization in our humanitarian response. So we were able to submit a proposal that was a bit different from our normal. Um, we submitted our proposal with much less detail than normal. Um, instead of specifying exactly the activities, locations, and partners, we provided a range um, and a, a scope of what we might do depending on partner interest. So it included the list of activities that we might do in child protection, which are I'm sure familiar to most of you, um, awareness raising, case management, parenting skills. So within the scope of what we normally do, um, but we left it open um, with the understanding that during startup phase, we would identify our partners um, and really work with them to finalize the approach. Um, so we were lucky enough to um, receive funding from uh, USAID's Bureau of Hum Humanitarian Assistance um, and appreciated their flexibility in implementing this. So in the process of our partner selection, we also did things slightly differently. So instead of identifying the partners that maybe had the highest capacity or the most expertise in child protection, we really wanted organizations that were motivated to get into the humanitarian sphere um, in response to the expanded crisis, um, or were interested in getting more expertise in child protection. Um, so. This was a slightly different approach for us. Um, it also allowed us to target women-led organizations um, and really prioritize some of the organizations we felt were missing in the response. Um, the co-creation process then took place, um, really us giving information to the partners about what the options were. So obviously we're still working within a certain scope of child protection. So we shared those options with them they shared with us the community needs. And together we agreed on what their scope of work would be and where they would be operating. Um, so a bit different as well, instead of one kind of comprehensive approach across our project, targeting the big, highly populated areas, we really worked with these smaller organizations to target gaps, um, fill service needs, um, support where existing government infrastructure was not able to um, implement at that time. Um, we also worked with each of the partners on a capacity strengthening plan, which was tailored, so not a one size fits all. We did identify that there were key things that all of them had to have, um, knowledge of humanitarian principles, working on the child protection minimum standards, child safeguarding, um, but then we really wanted each of them to identify what their objectives were with their organization. Did they want to become specialized child protection actors? Did they want to expand geographically? So making sure that it was based on their motivations as an organization. And then we really worked parallel with the capacity strengthening and the implementation, which is also a challenge, um, but that allowed us to start implementing respond to children's needs at the same time we can implement capacity strengthening with our partners. Obviously, there are some challenges with this. Um, so one obviously being the competing priorities. So we are at one time providing services to children who desperately need them in crisis. Um, and that is from day one of the conflict. However, we're also trying to work on capacity strengthening, which is training, mentorship, um, secondment of staff, lots of meetings and discussions. Um, and so that really takes time both for 
doing those things, but it takes a lot of time for the partners. You know, we were trying to get them to come to trainings and implement activities and recommending they go to cluster meetings. So really trying to prioritize with them so that they could get what they need to get done early on and then layer on additional activities and capacity strengthening where possible. Um, we also have compliance still. So our compliance is still flowing down to them. So financial, um, administrative, operational, procurement, this is all still, um, these are all still things we have to work on with them. And when you have a dozen partners who are very new to this context and these requirements, it takes a lot of work and they have to put, with, put up with us. <laughs> so definitely a lot of time, um, a lot of explanations of why we were requesting these, um, these things from them. It's definitely an issue there. Also the time frame. Humanitarian projects are short term. We're normally working on 12 months, maybe 18 months. It's a lot to get done. And especially when you're talking about protection partners and child protection, we all know that we're not just distributing kits, although that can be part of it. We really rely on our staffing and our staffing to be um, dedicated, motivated again, um, but also have a lot of information. Um, and we do have the benefit in the localization approach that people are already invested in the community. They know who they're working with. So that is a good starting point. Um, but it still is a challenge to start up, close down, start up, especially with protection programming. I will go on to a couple of our successes. So we had amazing partners. Um, they were a slightly range of organizations. So some had more capacity than others. Some were very new. Um, but we, one of our objectives was to make sure that partners could then get funding from other organizations. A great success for us would be if they no longer needed our funding and they could get it more directly from donors. Um, one of our partners, Lampa, a very, very motivated, excited young organization um, in the East on the front lines, they have now gone out and gotten their own funding from the UN and others. Um, they have been amazing with their ability to provide comprehensive child protection, really understanding the layered needs of children and how to put different activities together. We also had two, uh, Cherny have European and Search for Innovation that worked with smaller NGOs. Um, so they, sorry, not NGOs, community groups. So they identified local, local grassroots um, groups that had additional needs with children with disabilities. And so they were able to then work with an even lower level of, um, of the community to, to reach out to those specific needs. So a lots, lots of successes. I would say the key takeaway um, is that localization is possible from the beginning of the conflict. It is possible and we should work on doing it. It just requires adaptation. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for this. I think it's very interesting and I really like the way you're uh, approaching capacities because usually capacity is the first excuse for donor or international NGO to say we're not giving you funds. You don't have the, the capacity. So it's really nice to know that uh, you're working on this. Uh, Marcelo, I would like to turn now to you to take us through your opening remarks. Yeah. Thank you very much and um, nice to have you all here. Maybe I'll start from her last statement, say that localization is possible from, you know, from the beginning. And I think Ukraine has shown us how a um, group of community volunteers and community-based organization has been the first to respond to um, the immediate needs of the population there um, during the onset of the, the last war in, in, in the country. Um, so this is proving that acknowledging that the risk themselves are facing, um, there is need to leverage more from this type of organization. I think in the last years, um, localization, the agenda has made improvement and progresses, although this kind of organization are still facing a lot of um, barriers. Um, in Ukraine, Street Child um, is now working um, with uh, almost 30 um, organizations, a consortium of about 30 organizations, different sites, different type, um, and uh, you know, different experiences. We are leveraging from community-based organizations, civil society organizations, but also national uh, organizations. And uh, we are structuring in a way where 
obviously a consortium of third organization is quite difficult to manage, but we trying to create a, a sort of pyramidal system where these national organizations who have um, already had a lot of experience and, and knowledge can also support in creating clusters and uh, provide that level of peer support, mentoring, and, uh, and coordination. The project is about $1.4 uh, million, but 80%. 85% of the funds are going straight to, to these local um, organizations. Now, there have been several steps um, to identify and bring this organization in. Obviously, there is a lot of work to be done at the beginning for the identification, but then the need to simplify the processes, so simplify the due diligence, uh, provide a simplification for program management and um, as she was also saying it's very important to support the organization to identify the areas that they want to focus on for their own capacity strengthening but providing the flexibility to um, to seek for those opportunities by themselves um, now for more than oops, 20 sorry. years here we have two representatives of international organization it's i feel Kind of a shame that we were not able to sponsor and bring our partners here but at least we try to um, uh, ask them to share more um, about their work so we have here maria from a uh, shelter organization who will share with us what they are doing within this uh, project for more than 20 years the charity foundation shelter plus has been working with people of different ages we mainly focused on children and youth in our activities through a variety of cultural, artistic, educational, and sport activities, we help children grow into holistic individuals that can fulfill themselves in different directions. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the question of social protection of children has become even more relevant and acute. Therefore, it's of particular importance for us to support children in difficult life circumstances. Additionally, we pay special attention to children with disabilities and children from large families. Thanks to participation in the project from Street Child, Shelter Plus has gained an invaluable experience in social work in addition to financial support. Our team was able to receive the necessary training to help kids effectively prevent and report violence. Also, we were able to provide psychological support through activities, and that is the main value we gained from cooperation and support of Street Child. I think, you know, for us, it was important to identify this organization who, as she said, has already 20 years of experience and already work in the area of uh, social support and um, support to individual children. But because of the new contest for us was also and for them was important to build upon that experience and introduce like, you know, the knowledge and the standard to work on case management in, uh, in humanitarian setting. But in addition to deliver, you know, effective programs, they also need to, they needed to strengthen their financial part, the, the financial system to absorb humanitarian fund and then absorb uh, more fund. I'm also bringing this, the experience of another partner, Natasha, and um, uh, she's, she's been asked um, what she's expecting from this partnership and also what she can give. Hello, uh, my name is Natalia Vishnevetska. I'm a head of uh, local Ukrainian NGO, DOM 4824. And uh, uh, if to answer uh, the question what we bring to the partnership and what we want to get from the partnership, I would say that uh, first of all we want to see the real partnership when uh, both parts are valuable, when uh, partners really depend and really uh, benefit from uh, from this partnership. So because we are local organization, so we bring the local context understanding of it. Uh, we bring our professional expertise uh, uh, and uh, in social uh, sphere and social services and we bring the connections and understanding of our uh, audience, our target groups and uh, understanding of their needs. And what we want to get is to see actually uh, because we are a local organization and uh, we want to complement it, so we want to see the wider perspective, what is happening in the world, how it influences our work, and how our work influence, uh, uh, can influence uh, what uh, the changes in the world. 
we want to extend our planning horizons. Uh, we want to see how we can um, uh, design the longer projects and we want also to have strategic support when we are, um, when it is possible to introduce changes, to see results of changes and to evaluate and to show them to have continuity in our work. Thank you. So, one, yeah, yeah. Um, basically, I like the fact that she's asking for a real partnership, you know, building trust, transparency, and mutual respect is, is uh, fundamental. But also, you know, very clear request of strengthening the communication, like the communication part to communicate their impact, how to generate more funds. We were talking about the restriction, like the, the gap we have on child protection, but how you know, bringing evidence or the impact they're generating could generate more funding for the organization. I think very quickly, um, what we are pushing for is the fact that we all agree that funding should reach um, as directly as possible the local population, yet the power and the voice is strongly and disproportionately weighted towards UN agencies, international NGOs, there are progress that have been made. Um, for us, from an international organization perspective, we are reflecting on not just what we can do for local organization, but how can we look internally to, for instance, be as lean as possible? How can we maximize our value within this uh, space? But for instance, how we can have small offices, how we structure our team so that we are not um, we are not heavy or we are not absorbing the, the funding. Um, maybe a question for the audience before I pass through. Can I? I have one question. Now it's anonymous, let's say, even though we can see <laughs> each other's face, but we are not going to ask. Um, like whether you are working with a, a local organization or an international NGO, or even if you are a donor, I don't know if we have donor here, Think about your current partnership, whether with an NGO, a local NGO or an international NGO. Where do you see your consortium stand on? Like the first example, the second and the third. You can raise your hand and say one, two or three. If you think about your, if you have a current consortium or partnership, where do you see it? One, two, or three. Yeah, very briefly, it's like how we can be almost transparent, let's say, or invisible, meaning how can we reduce our presence, for instance, maybe by putting the, our partner uh, at the front, direct contact with the donor, maybe uh, allowing them to have direct access to uh, the funding and for us to provide that minimal support. So. It's, a, it's a, a further step of, you know, um, the localization possibilities that we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's important to realize that the uh, relationship between international NGOs and local NGOs is, is take and give, right? It, both of them are providing something. It's not that uh, local NGOs are receiving funding and then uh, but uh, uh, they need to build their capacities. They need, as you said, like uh, uh, in order to absorb more funding, they need to work on their capacities and so, but also international NGOs need to work on their capacities to be more local friendly and then learn from what they have. And I like, uh, I think Natasha, what she said, like they do understand the context. They have something to provide in this relationship. So. Uh, recognizing this is very important and it's also worth mentioning that uh, street child is co-leading uh, the um, or co-chairing the advisory group for localization within the alliance so uh, um, your perspective on, on this is is very uh, very important um, now i would like to ask you some questions maybe i'll turn back to you uh, emily uh, you did mention the co-creation approach that you are working on um, what were some of the most significant uh, adjustments your organization uh, had to make from traditional operational uh, methods 
uh, to the new method that you are working on? And how uh, did these adjustments affect the project outcomes? I mean, I think going back to the, I mean, the co-creation process means that there's a lot more flexibility that we need to build in and uncertainty that maybe we're not <laughs> so used to having. Um, I think we had to understand that there might be changes from the proposal during startup throughout the project and figure out how to build that in within the structures that we have. So I think you probably all know when you go into an agreement, that takes time. Maybe then you identify different community needs or additional activities that are needed. That requires a modification. <laughs> and so I think finding, as Marcello said, simplified processes that might help us do that faster so we can be more responsive um, is something that we really worked on. We're now in our, the second phase of the program. And so I think we've made a lot of progress in that. Um, I think it's also understanding what our role is as as being the technical, like accountable for the technical quality of the project. Ultimately, we are receiving the funding. We do have to make sure that the implementation is high quality and finding a balance between what is required and what we might discuss with partners that they can adapt. You know, um, as I mentioned, there are some things that are not negotiable. Um, you know, we can only work within our certain activities. We can, we have to have child safeguarding policies, um, but maybe in the types of curriculum that partners are using um, or in their work with the local authorities who are already doing something, as um, I think Shima was saying yesterday, we're not coming in to say, this is how we do it. This is how you have to do it, and we will overwrite what you're already doing. So it was filling those gaps takes a lot more effort to, you know, make those adjustments and those tweaks. But ultimately, it means that we have better programming and we're really responding to those niche needs. Um, I think another thing that we that we did differently was really emphasize prevention and response to burnout with our partners. Um, they had so many burdens on them for this so many new things they're always the ones on the front lines but especially in the way that we have um, a short program trying to get them a lot of new knowledge um, a lot of different tasks they have to do to uh, to partner with us um, you know we built that into funding made sure that advocated for them to include that in their budgets um, and also in to include it when we do our capacity strengthening so when we did trainings when we worked on mentorship with them um, building it into the way we worked with them, not just saying, okay, here's a budget, you go off and you do your staff care. Um, so it was a, definitely a big part of the conversation of the whole project and part of our two-way communication. You know, we didn't just say, we're doing a bunch of trainings, come and sit for five days, learn how to do child protection, go off and do it. Um, but really sitting with them and using our technical staff and saying, we don't know everything. How can we help you get the information you need, which might not be, directly coming from us. So some of those changes, but a lot going back to what you said about improving communication, um, the trust with the partners was was a really big thing. Yeah, thank you for, for the answer. I think it's also very important to realize that there are a lot to do and that we have the power to do those, right? Like, yeah, your organization didn't uh, fall apart, right? When you implemented this. <laughs> so yeah, we can we can try better. Uh, maybe a question for you also, Marcello. Um, how do you balance the need for rapid response in the humanitarian crisis uh, with the equ equally important requirement of building local capacities and ensuring sustainable environments? So we need to start from the principle that in order to have effective response, you know, to respond to the immediate needs, we need to allow this organization to remain agile and focus on the work. Um, too often, I mean, understanding also the, 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 the requirement for compliance and risk management, but too often these organizations are expected to work um, as an NGO, so with a lot of um, admin heavy burden with a lot of investment for, for compliance. And this is distracted, distracting from you know, the, 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 the key work. And this is going back to this um, idea where uh, we need to understand what um, comparative advantage we can bring and without maybe competing for the activity or replicating activities. So 
in here for specific for this project we identify also new ways for capacity strengthening like usually we used to have budget and organized training for for partners this time we allowed them to we, we provided them flexible budget so that our role was mainly to work together on mentoring, identify the areas that they want to um, work on, but they had that budget to search for themselves the opportunities at their own time, at their own pace. The preferred methodology for learning maybe is not the, the, the standard um, training. Also a knowledge that, you know, in Ukraine, there is a strong um, private sector that is, you know, um, uh, providing that 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 knowledge that uh, that support that is is needed so we are trying there we are trying to be there as lean as possible and allow them to focus on the work while um we are trying to absorb that that part of uh, compliance that uh, as i said before we 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 simplified um, expectation on project on project management the reporting system uh, we are doing that dirty work, let's say, for, for, for them. Um, and be, and simplify, also simplify the work of the donor that, you know, through uh, one, one um, uh, consortium is able to work with multiple organizations and reach uh, this project specifically is about uh, for 35,000 um, children. Uh, the capacity building, like your approach on capacity building is, is amazing because capacity building is not always uh, um, workshops and training. It has more, it has the core funding, uh, in-house training, uh, like uh, flexible uh, uh, budgets that they can use in ways that they know it will build their capacities and help them more. So thank you very much for that. Um, now I would like to open the floor for maybe three questions to start with. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Susanna. Thanks very much. Well, first of all, just thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, so I'm Susanna Davis, I'm with Save the Children. I do a lot of work with the Alliance. Um, and one of my many hats with SAVE is to work a bit on localization and humanitarian coordination. And in some of our projects, one of some of the key learnings and feedback that we're getting from national actors are on two really important points. One, they're saying they need more visibility. Um, and that means being able to, for example, engage in person in global meetings and learning events like this. Um, and they're set, the other is they're saying that they need either more indirect costs to be able to invest in their own organizations or and or they need more investments in institutional capacity strengthening. So I know Marcello touched a little bit on strengthening financial systems, I think, in one of uh, his organization and one of the organizations with whom you worked. But I was curious to hear maybe from both of you how in your work like you have addressed or reflected these kind of two needs around visibility and institutional capacity or what you think we could be doing better obviously acknowledging a little bit the elephant in the room that you both did try to acknowledge which is that none of the national partners that you've worked with are here with us and able to represent themselves or benefit from all of the side conversations and engagement that they would have gotten if they were here Good afternoon. Following that slide shown on the screen, I do believe there are very clear roles defined between local or international NGOs. But there are some NGOs that are really large and they have their own sites and they're doing strong monitoring in or thematic and cross-sectional issues. How do you translate this to simplify? What would you simplify? <laughs> Another important point. In Colombia, we're talking about community action because when we're talking about local capacity, we're talking from the strengths, not from the weaknesses. And even during strong crisis, everything has to grow. So we're talking about the communities. What do they bring to the table? And even people who are very poor, they still contribute. 
how do you see this? My question to our two panelists is about uh, leadership, because uh, leadership on the humanitarian sector is also one of localization issue. How are you both also supporting your partners to make them more strong in leadership under their humanitarian response? Okay, thank you for the questions. We will address those. Now, feel free to take, take maybe three, four minutes each and answer. All of it. <laughs> All of it. Okay. Should we start maybe? Yeah. Okay. Um, I hope I've captured everything. So starting from more visibility, yeah, good point. And I think it's the same discussion we are having about, you know, bringing children more, like the voice of the children. No, it's a similar, a discussion that the sector had for 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 ages we're making improvement uh, from from our perspective um, I think we had good example where we for instance we were able to bring some of our partner to um, a UN General Assembly um, on the Ed transforming education summit and we had partner from Cameroon from Nigeria from Afghanistan and that was you know a very powerful moment also to shift a little bit the, the 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 perspective also you know in the in the big buildings let's say um but at the same time uh talking linked to the, to uh leadership cpor uh, the the global cpor also has been pushing this this agenda and i found very interesting a collaboration we had with them where we're also investing in um, supporting the national CPOR to make the, the coordination system um, co-lead by uh, local organizations, so developing guidelines, um, um, criteria, and uh, specific support for um, uh, potential coordinators. So I think there are some countries that are more advanced than, than other, but uh, you know we are creating some uh, best practices and example that can inform other other contests. Um, on the use of indirect fund, indirect fund, I think we had a, an interesting um, um, experience where, <clears throat> in some contests, we are trying to promote what we call a reverse prime. So, go in a consortium but bring. Um, our local partner uh, as a lead of the consortium. So to access directly the funding, to be at the forefront of the management of the relationship with the donor. And that um, is also contributing to the, um, the global indicator on localization, no? on, uh, on global funding to directly to local organization. But in some places we had to rethink that, that strategy, mainly because some donor were not yet um, allowing, for instance, overhead costs to, to national organizations. So we have to think about that. It's like, okay, if this organization is leading the consortium, we are not getting that, um, uh, you know, flexible funding that are so important for, that is so important for local organizations. So we had to review the strategy and eventually be the lead of the consortium and then pass the, the, um, the overhead cost to the local organization. Ideally, we would like to see you know, donor to be more uh, flexible on that so that we, we don't need to um, find shortcut for um, uh, accessing this flexible uh, funding. Maybe, apart. Maybe I'll speak to the community strengths uh, question. Um, if I understood correctly, you were highlighting that communities already have their own capacities, their own coping mechanisms. Um, I think this is where we really tried to work with so many different levels within um, the Ukraine context. So we did work with larger organizations, um, not the big ones, who are basically like international organizations, um, you know, right to protection. There was a couple that were really big that we said, okay, you guys have your own capacity, you have your funding, um, but then just kind of work through different levels. And we did work with communities and identify their um, existing structures. So we worked a lot with schools, with teachers, um, with parents. We had a lot of uh, child-friendly spaces operating from libraries and um, 
other community spaces. So we really tried to recognize where there was already the expertise um, and just facilitate where they, they identified they wanted to, um, to expand. One of our partners, for example, Civic Initiatives, um, they worked in a small rural community which already had psychologists and they were able to provide services. They were already doing that service provision prior to the conflict. And what that organization did was provide upscaling. So they trained these um, psychologists on art therapy to respond to the changing needs of the children in the crisis. So basically just giving them additional tools um, in their tool belt to respond to the situations that they were seeing on the ground. So I think that we, we really hoped that what we were focusing on and the flexibility we allowed to partners gave them the ability to reach those, those, um, those niche needs that otherwise we wouldn't know about and we wouldn't be able to reach. Um, and maybe on the leadership point, I think, you know, as I mentioned, we wanted to really prioritize women-led organizations, organizations that supported LGBTQ, um, who are often not able to get funding. They aren't able to grow because they can't get the initial support. So really looking at the leadership of the organizations we worked with, and as I said, we did encourage them to go to cluster meetings, but not just to attend the cluster meetings, to be seen, um, to attend where it helped them, to explain to them how they can participate in these different structures to get the most out of it so they can get the contextualized resources. They don't have to start from scratch. Um, they can meet people and also giving them travel budgets so they can go from their oblast to Kyiv if needed. So we work in areas far from Kyiv, so in the west, in the east, um, bringing them together so they can also share between themselves because they have a lot of information. So um, I think we tried to build in a lot of that different, um, as I said, like tweaks to, to really be specific and intentional about how we worked with them. Great, thank you very much for answering that. Um, we, may, we might have some more questions, but but I think it's not fair that uh, you ask all the questions and you listen. So maybe we will have some questions for you in, in return. So it's like localization, right? Like they can give. So would you, have, would you like to ask a question to the audience? And then we can take your question maybe afterwards or. Yeah, maybe um, I would. Can I? I was curious to to have this opportunity of you know being here in Panama with a lot of representatives of uh, this region. Um, I have you know my limited experience uh, in 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 Africa and now engaging with uh, with our colleagues in in Ukraine. Um, I would like to know if there is any reflection on how this this discussion on how localization is, is framed and discussed is relevant in uh, Latin America and, and Caribbean, knowing that um, you know, the, 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 the crisis management, the risk management, the crisis management is already, already have like strong um, local organization, uh, central government, regional platform that are uh, at the front line. So if the challenges are similar in terms of, I don't know, accessing funds, the role of the UN system and the NGOs. Um, do we have similarities or it's different context and so localization should be framed uh, differently? Are we lucky enough to have anyone from the region who would like to answer this? Yeah, please. I worked during 30 years with international cooperation in Colombia. In Colombia, we have a very big challenge because we haven't had that much cooperation since 1997, then we started seeing more. But initially, organizations strengthened, but local organizations in Colombia were always there, especially for human rights work. But stemming from the conflict, humanitarian help started springing up to work with the displacement. We had nine, peop nine million people internally displaced in Colombia. And in that situation, we got the, the full UN system and European cooperation, especially for human rights. And then we had North American 
help to work for the substitution of illegal crops and NGOs that strengthen and base organizations. So now, when we had the Paris Declaration, the government started strengthening and but started closing the doors to the Colombian civil society organizations. Since 2016, Colombia has a peace agreement and with this peace agreement, to everyone's surprise, UNDP is the executor to this um, peace project uh, with direct competition with the local organizations. So a lot of these na were nationalized looking for resources. So it's difficult to determine which are the roles because if you have different roles, financing begins to be a point of our argument. Very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. I know you have a lot to say and uh, I would love to listen to that, but we, we're running out of time. Emily, do you have another question or would you rather take a question? Uh, you decide. Do we have time for both? <laughs> I don't no. know. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I don't think we do. Okay, well then we can, we can take a question. Take a question. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. It was very insightful. Um, I really liked when you mentioned that for you, localization is really about also the local organizations being able to access the funding um, from donors eventually without the intermediary of big NGOs. Um, but you also mentioned that some of the challenges that um, local organizations face, face are linked to the fact that there's a lot of compliance, um, the fact that they, the funding is not as flexible, they are not able to access overhead costs. Um, and my question is, um, because we are working with local organizations, but I think um, the responsibility is not only on them, but also on the donors. Um, so in terms of advocacy work, um, have you done any work with the donors? So when you're discussing funding, when you're developing a project narrative, are you speaking up so that asking them to be more flexible? Um, yeah, that's my question. Yes, that is a, a big, uh, a big discussion point always. One way that we try to um, at least work on this a bit in the program was to have workshops with the partners. So we had a USAID rules and regs training <laughs> with the organizations to try to get them to um, to know what are the key points, you know, what are the, the really big things that they have to work on and working with them to develop budgets and narratives and um, all of the things that go along with the proposals um, so that maybe they could they could do that. But there are still barriers, I think. In terms of advocacy, um, I know that there is a localization policy coming out from USAID soon. I know there's a draft. Um, hopefully we'll see in there maybe some changes and some ideas of how the compliance can be made slightly simpler for the local organizations because, yeah, we can have the staff to do all of these, um, you know, annexes and reports and the financial compliance, but, um, you know, I think it would be great if we could use our experience to identify what is reasonable for us to expect from our local partners um, and then advocate and say, you know, this is this a good meeting point? Is this a good compromise? So um, I think hopefully <laughs> we can do some advocacy because I think we did learn um, a bit around that and working with them to say also this is why, not just this is what you have to do for compliance. This is why we're asking this of you and how can we maybe find some some middle ground that we can propose but yeah definitely more work to be done on that i don't know if you have maybe very quickly to acknowledge also the, the great work that was done huh? even less with education cannot wait can um who um which organize you know a localization uh, um uh, group within their steering committee and is really at the forefront on you know to ensure that more um, more local organizations are um, uh, within their multi-year response plan or first emergency um, response. So I think those are also good examples that can influence other donors that maybe are 
um, still a little bit, um, I would say behind without naming, but I also had like very strong negative experience of, you know, opportunities that were missed because there was so much um, fear of, you know, risks that normally are just perceived risks that are only associated to local organization, not international NGO. So sometimes this is very um, uh, worry. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Deserve a round of applause. Uh, um, at the end of the session, I want to ask how many INGOs, UN agencies, donors do we have in the room? Nice. I hope you're leaving with <laughs> a lot of questions, a lot of things that you are going to do the next week. Uh, in order to uh, um, push the localization agenda. How many local NGOs do we have? One, two, three, four. Nice. Uh, well, guys, make more noise. Guess, guess what? It's working in Ukraine, so it should work in your context as well. Thank you very much for attending and seeing you in other sessions.